love international animation society. Um, usually I, I love to do things with, uh, related with animation and animation producing. But today we have a panelist that those, these panelists are really, really cool. Um, and I'll, I'll give them a, li a little, little be brief introduction about who they are and I'll let them introduce themselves first. But with this particular uh, panel, because it's called Ask Me Anything, if you guys have questions during the session, please let us know so that we can ask them your questions. Uh, and there'll, there'll be somebody who runs over the microphone to you. What's your name? Yes, Teresa will run over the microphone to you. So hello, let's start with our first panelist. This is Elisa Lewis, uh, a very, very um, prominent animator in the animator um, animation um, industry in Atlanta. And Elisa is a, uh, has also animated on Archer, uh, the anime nominated, uh, anime award winning art, uh, animated series Archer for a very, very long time. And she is also uh, the Emmy, Emmy judge? Yes. Judge, yeah, she is, she's judge for the Emmys category. And also, Elisa is a veteran. She's a strategic consultant in animation. And she has also done a lot of different things. But we'll get back to you and let you introduce yourself more fully after this. And the next person is Akil. Akil is a game developer at Primal Screen. Primal Screen does a lot of different properties for things like Nickelodeon and also PBS. And does a lot of web-based games as well, too. So we'll come back to Akil after this. And the last person is Jeff Yu. And Jeff Yu currently works at Pulse Works. Uh, it's a VR company that does like uh, simulations. Also, at the, if you go to the Georgia Aquarium, you'll be able to see uh, their their ride there as well. And prior to this, Jeff also worked in board games at uh, Cool Mini or Not as well too. So let's first uh, start with Elisa. I mean, I introduced you, but I don't think I can introduce you as much as you know you know yourself. So could you give us a few words about your thing? Sure. Um, so my educational background is from Savannah College of Art and Design. Um, I left with an animation degree, and um, I went straight into television. I worked at Georgia Public Broadcasting on Channel 8, uh, working uh, with a lot of their um, entities, and also for Floyd County Productions, working on Archer. I've worked with Captain Planet's Planetary Movement, 30 Rock, uh, a bunch of music videos, some commercial work, stuff for pharmaceutical and a lot of experimental pieces. Uh, nowadays, I work with a lot of community-based uh, animations, trying to give back to the community and give a lot of educational um, snippets out there. And uh, um, what was I gonna say? Yes, I do judge for the Emmys, for the Southeast, for Houston, and for New York. And um, I'm also a strategic consultant, so I help people who are lost in their careers and lost with their projects and help them pitch their shows as well. Credentials. <laughs> uh, next up, we have Akil. Would you like to tell us about yourself? Uh, so my name is Akil. Um, I'm also a SCAD grad. Uh, we graduated the same year, I think, as well. Um, uh, after school, I've graduated in uh, interactive design um, and game design. So, um, and I went straight into development. So I'm a developer at Primal Screen right now. Uh, when I first started, um, I worked on Facebook games. Um, so like properties like The Walking Dead and stuff like that. Um, afterwards, uh, I did freelance for uh, Activision, um, worked on games like Skylanders and um, My Little Pony, which is fun. And um, let's see, what else? Uh, yeah, so I currently work for Primal Screen. We usually do stuff for um, PBS and um, uh, other curriculum kind of games. Um, it's mostly for children, so it's uh, like a Three to six age group um, who like have to play games on their on their website. Um, so at school they'll go to the website and they'll play like some of the curriculum based games, um, but like Dinosaur Train or like some of those other properties that that air on the PBS. Um, and yeah, that's uh, about it for me. Yeah, and uh, I am Jeff Ryu. I start off as a uh, 2D artist, so my original goal was to be like a mock artist. But then along the way, I learned more about animation and uh, 3D pipeline, and I eventually got an internship at uh, high res for animation. And I was like, oh, it's awesome. You've seen all the particle effects, you've seen you know, the floating, and all the characters running around. And so uh, the cosplay uh, seemed like the route that I would go. And so uh, as I pursued that, I eventually got a job at a board game company called Cool Mini or Not. And I got to work on the marketing for games like Zombicide, uh, Rum and Bones, uh, do some cosplay art for Xenoshift. And then while that was going on, I also uh, worked on other side projects with, um, with uh, like indie groups that did like Unreal Engines 
uh, 3D horror game. And so from learning Unreal, I was able to transition to uh, VR because the, the company I'm at now, Pulsework, they use uh, Neo Engine uh, for most of the uh, entertainment rides too. So as Ginger mentioned, if you've gone to the Georgia Aquarium, they have these like giant yellow submarines. Uh, I think they're gonna move it now like a few feet over, <laughs> but uh, for like for Sony reasons, I think they have a new exhibit. But the game was made in Unreal, and so I had to take what I know from doing 2D and mix that with 3D. And if I'm designing, the, helping out with you know the level design and the 3D work, you know all that gets factored in. So um, yeah, it, I found it really interesting just you know moving, uh, uh, learning like the whole range you know from 2D to 3D. So yeah. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I think like the first question that a lot of people might have as well, um, and this one is a broad one, so we'll scale it down a bit, Fred. The broad question would be, how do you get into the industry? You know, like uh, how do how do I get into the game industry? And if I want to do game art, for example, you you guys have mentioned like oh Blizzard, Activision, High Res. If I want to do game arts, like what should I know? Like uh, how 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 do I know if I'm good enough to do that? And also, uh, I think like what types of different like um, uh, skill sets might be required. But I know that's a little bit too broad. So let's like like, like nail it down for a little bit. Let's start with the first thing too. Do you think that uh, if somebody wants to get into games and maybe they have a, they don't have a background, number one, do they have to go to school for that? Or number two, uh, what are the uh, some of the tips of the different ways you think that people can get into games, uh, or games art, if they're already doing other kind of art like animation art, uh, sequential art, or just like even illustration art? I'll definitely say that uh, if you're first starting out and you don't know how to make games, then there is a plethora of resources for you, like YouTube University, where you can attend uh, for free. And there are a lot of other um, software programs that allow for you to learn on their uh, website. Toon Boom's a great one where they have information. Um, Lynda.com went into uh, LinkedIn, and now it's LinkedIn Learning. So you can learn from there as well. Uh, any of those online platforms uh, will allow you to learn how to make games. Uh, but the way you're going to get into a game studio is really by knowing people. Um, most people know people. So it's really important that while you're learning to make games and you're making games on your own, that you're also going out there and meeting people, coming to conferences like this, and making sure that you shake hands and get contact information. Uh, I do also want to piggyback off of what uh, Lisa said. Uh, my job at uh, Cool Mini actually started because I went to Siege. So um, before, what happened was I usually go to all the art panels where you know you meet all the concept artists and 3D animators. But what ends up happening is everyone else wants to talk to them as well too because you know everyone wants to be an artist as well. So what I did was I went to the Kickstarter panel instead uh, because maybe I want to create my own content. And one of the guys there was in Cool Mini, so that's how they uh, mark. Uh, how they uh, require, uh, acquired most of the funding for their board games. So I talked with a guy there and they said, oh yeah, we're looking for a graphic artist and we'll need to help us with marketing too. And you know, uh, would you be interested? And I said, yes, I would. And uh, so uh, a month later, I joined in and I've been there and I worked there for about five years. So sometimes it's not just um, uh, trying to like go one avenue, you want to look all these other routes too. But as she said, yeah, definitely if you know a person uh, at these conventions, that's, that's the way to go. And also to mention your second job at Pulsework, where did you get that from? So Ginger knew a guy called Orion, uh, who also uh, worked with Andrew Greenberg, and uh, she introduced me to Orion, and I got a visit to Pulseworks, and they, uh, you know, had me ride their transporter ride and uh, sent me an art test for VR, uh, for Unreal Engine development, and yeah, that's how I got into the game. And the way we knew Orion was from the portfolio review, because he was one of the reviewers too. So definitely don't forget to check out the portfolio review sessions. And Akil. Yeah, I, I'll definitely say like who you know is very important in the industry. Um, that's how I got my first job as well. Um, my first job was doing Flash games, and uh, it's just someone I knew who was working at school. Um, one of my good friends. Uh, they taught me everything developer-wise. So when they got a job, they kind of just said, oh, I know this person. If you need someone, um, he's, he's really good. So you should, you should just get, get him in. Um, for me, like, that was really lucky because I was right out of school. Um, and I know that's not going to be the case for a lot of people. So just get to know people, and you'll definitely get like, the opportunity. Teresa, may we get a microphone? <laughs> the lovely lady. Wow. 
Yeah, first question. All right. Could we have your name, uh, you know, like uh, where you are in life, just a little bit of like your name and what you're doing, like studying right now in your classroom? Um, so my name's Nora. I'm a first year computer science student. Um, I've got a little bit of uh, background in, in like 2D illustrations and whatnot, but I'm really trying to get into animation. My question is, um, would you say that it becomes a lot more useful uh, to build kind of your knowledge of the technical aspect of developing and kind of the the actual programming aspect of developing games? Um, do you find that it's useful for when you're animating as well, or is it possible to kind of get into the field with little to no technical experience whatsoever? I will say that it is it is very useful to have an artist that knows um, the development side of things. Um, because that's if you know how Unity works, if you know how like any of the programs that well, as a developer, like we're going to be making tools for you to help you integrate stuff into the game. Um, but if you if you know the technical aspect, that's definitely a plus on your end. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would agree uh, for this, uh, for the same reasons. Um, for me, whenever I develop uh, uh, like levels within Unreal, uh, Orion gives me a spec. Uh, that I have to adhere to. So when you do your animations, there's a certain amount of frames you you know try to adhere by. And in the old and in the olden days too, when they used to uh, when I was on uh, high res uh, uh, might when I was doing that, um, they would tell you, oh okay, you know you have this certain amount of frames. You know if you're doing a tag, you know maybe like 14 frames, 15 frames or something, and then you're like loop it, whatever. So you, you can't be like, oh I'm gonna do 32 frames because then it's gonna be super long. Uh, these days though, with uh, like Unreal Engine for example, you can actually make it longer and, and chop it up and do montages. But, uh, and so if you're able to know the capabilities of what you're working in, it definitely helps with what, with the creativ with the creativity you're able to put into your work. Any thoughts, Kazuto? No, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, uh, yes, I'll, I'll, a really quick insert before we go to the gentleman in the back is also what you've mentioned as like what these uh, um, panelists are saying is, yes, it's, uh, you don't always need to have the background to get into the thing, but it will definitely make it easier and make you stand out above the competition. Because I think the keyword is also learning to optimize for that particular game because it saves them money. If, for example, you're doing an animation and you don't know how to rig a character or break it down, that means somebody else will have to come in, do the work twice. So one of the things that we also want to plug is the Global Game Jam. So if you are an artist, never done game before, definitely try Global Game Jam because that's a good way to kind of throw yourself into collaboration with other people to kind of learn a little bit of the pipeline and they'll tell you kind of, hey, we need kind of this, we need that as well. So what's your Hi. name, uh, a little bit of your background and your question. Okay, so my name is Chris Crawford. Uh, I'm a 3D artist at the Art Institute of Atlanta. I'm actually a senior. So I got here a little late, so I just wanted to ask like, how did you guys get into art and what sort of like inspirations helped you uh, sort of stay in this field? And like uh, my dad always told me nothing kills a plan A than a plan B. So are you burning I, out? No, <laughs> no, no, I'm sticking with this forever. Well, um, before I was going to do art, um, when I was in high school, my plan was to become a doctor, you know, the typical Asian thing, right? But uh, once I figured out that, oh man, you know, I really like this art thing, I started pursuing that wholesale, and you know, I gave up on calculus and all that to to do it. Of course, I know it's more useful now. I'm starting to, you know, learn more about like, you know, uh, uh, like hypothesis testing for like business reasons. But um, once I got into uh, uh, art, it, it was mainly my love for anime at the time. As I said, I was going to do like manga and and you know that type of uh, illustration style. But then I started being, uh, I, I got influenced by, you know, the, the games I played, you know, like the ones from Blizzard before Blizzard is what Blizzard is now. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, there's, there's that. And then uh, the animation I was uh, introduced to, th um, you know, through the history of animation courses too, you know, all that got added on to what I was doing. Um, so, yeah, like, long process. Yeah, so um, I wanted to be an astronaut. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you guys. So that didn't happen. Um, but uh, when I went to school, I actually didn't really know what I was going to end up being after school. Um, I just do dove into development, and I really liked it. And that's pretty much what people are asking for most of, most of the time. So I ended up getting lucky. Um, and that's how I've stayed in the industry um, for so long, pretty much. Everyone needs developers, because that's how you make the game. Um, and yeah. Uh, so I've always wanted to be an animator. 
I watched Bugs Bunny being drawn to life when I was two, and I thought, that's what I want to do. And I started doing everything I could to move towards that, but my family was in the military, and we moved all the time, so I couldn't take proper art classes. And when I finally got to Savannah College of Art and Design to take animation classes, I could barely send an email. I was so backwards with technology. I was doing my animation with MS Paint and PowerPoint, so drawing That's it, impressive. exporting it, and then hitting like next really fast to watch it play. Um, you can also import um, audio in there, and that's how I would watch my lip sync. Um, so I get to school, and there's this like huge mountain of information, and I realize that I'm kind of in the middle ground of where I'm going to be artistically with everyone else who's at college. And um, I decided I need, I actually need a plan B. <laughs> so I started coming up with resources that I could offer people, trying to create more value within myself. And uh, through that, I was able to get into an organization called ASIPA South, formerly ASIPA Atlanta, which exposed me to a lot of people that were behind the scenes um, for animation. And through networking and meeting people and taking eventually an animation test, I got into my first big time studio. And uh, um, through doing a lot of the resources that I had created early on, I eventually later on rolled into doing a lot more recruiting and consulting and what I do mostly now, which is project management and the creative strategy. And to your point, you know, how do you keep a passion alive? I would say it also has to do with the people you hang out with. So if you're in a community that really uh, pushes your visions, you know, as in like um, even Facebook groups that you're seeing people posting things all the time, it does create an inspiration that you're like, oh, maybe I should post something. And, like, and that's why something like uh, uh, Inktober, uh, where you draw something that new every October, is something that artists really usually like, because they're like, oh, I'm going to challenge myself. I see people posting things, so that's such a, uh, an interesting as well, too. So, yes. Can we get him a microphone? Oh, yeah, after him, yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Ryan. I'm actually a senior here at KSU in the game design program. And so far, I've been focusing mostly on asset creation of various types, so 3D, uh, music, stuff like that, but it's mostly me filling in for holes in other that people other people don't have, and so I'm kind of getting like a well-rounded, uh, but when I'm looking at jobs, you know, start applying to things, I'm seeing very specialized jobs, you know, like rigging only, you know, or character animating only. Like, do you think it's better to kind of come out of college going into the field, not really kind of focusing on one thing, and then just find a job that fits your style or like to really hone in and try and like grab one specific uh, job type that like really suits you? I think definitely you should specialize in something. You should be good at at least one thing. It's easy to be, you know, a jack of all trades and master of none. So you have to master something because when someone's looking to fill a role, they're looking for that particular role to be filled. And then they do want you to have the other skills so that if anything happens in the pipeline, you can fill in and that you can do your job a lot better. Yeah, I would re re reiterate the same thing. Um, mostly in a studio setting, um, you're going to be doing one thing until someone needs something else. Um, and then if you do have that skill set, um, they'll go to you, and then they'll, they'll see about that. But they want to have you, like to get in the door first, you have to have that one thing that you can do really well. Uh, I've got a question for you. Are you applying to mainly like bigger studios, you know, like rock star type of stuff, or is it just anything? OK. Yeah, because yeah. uh, a lot of times at the bigger studios, they tend to look for more specialists. But then uh, at the studio I work at right now, uh, Pulseworks, we are more generalist. So for me, I took on everything from concepts to 3D to you know even in-game development and stuff like that. But it really depends on, on what you want to do. Like it took me a long time to get to where I am now. Uh, it wasn't just like I, you know, out of the gate I was already doing that. When I was out of the gate, I was still mainly 2D, and then I probably had slashed of, two, uh, of 3D here and there because of my animation uh, uh, second major. So um, yeah, like what, what he said about you know finding something that you're good at. For me, it was 2D, and um, I don't know if you do martial arts or anything like that, but it's also like cross training, you know, like MMA, right? Usually, they don't recommend you taking a little bit of everything, but rather you know get really good Thai boxing and then throw in a little bit of like you know jujitsu or you know maybe pancreation or something like that. I'm gonna throw in a quick tip here before we get to the gentleman here. Uh, one of the things that would be really useful to do is to spreadsheet. Uh, if you spreadsheet and put down all the companies you've applied to. Uh, you would can, you can see some of the recurring themes. If they say we need somebody who knows Unreal or uh, uh, Unity, then maybe that's something that you should think into getting into. 
because uh, uh, I mean, it doesn't mean that you have to do everything on their list because people are going to ask for more than usually that they need. They're always going to ask for, for, for more. And the other thing too is that like this way you can kind of tell also once you start going through your spreadsheet, what kind of companies are these? Because I mean, like we can say, oh, Tripwire and Hi-Res aren't as big as Blizzard, but they're still pretty big. So these would be still considered in the medium like a uh, higher tier. So if we're talking about smaller companies, we might be talking about um, like, you know, more educational games that have maybe just 10 people on their team or like maybe even five people on their team. So like n that will kind of help you uh, ob objectively gauge um, the, the, the type of like uh, company you're going for and what recurring um, factors they're asking for as well. Hello. All right, so my name is Brandon Moss. Um, I graduated from Kennesaw State University in the game development program uh, in July. And I'm everything, or I'm far from an artist. <laughs> so uh, I've dabbled in music, design, programming, business management, but not art. So um, my current day job is using Unity to make software that's not game related. But what I'm trying to do in after hours and on the weekends and is start up a studio. And I know everybody says that, but. Um, one of my problems is I have a group of close-knit friends that I grew up with and as we grew up we all split our separate ways and I was lucky enough to have one that went to business management, uh, one that went into programming and one that went into animation. But none that were 3D modelers or like those kind of artists. So that's kind of like half the game that I'm trying to make is the models. So um, I was wondering <clears throat> as an art, since you guys are artists, how, what kind of events do you go to? Would you go contracting for people? I know that nobody wants to work for exposure or whatever, uh, but where would be the best places to network with artists? It seems like everywhere I go, it's just programmer fest. <laughs> where have you been going? Uh, the game jams. Um, so the Kine I've mainly went to the Kennesaw game jams, and our major, even though it's a design and development major, it's like 90% programming. So. Those events, I don't find in a lot of artists. Um, GDC, you may find an artist or something, but they're going to be from a different state. So, I would like to plug a CFA South, <laughs> uh, the largest animation society in the southeastern United States. And um, every last Wednesday of the month, there is a mixer uh, where you will meet artists uh, throughout the entire pipeline. And it is at Joystick Game Bar from 6 to 8 p.m. And if you need more information about that, we have Pros. He's also on our committee as well as also at currently at Primal Screen, so you can talk to him afterwards as well. Mm -hmm. uh, quick question: um, Do you have do you know if um, Scad still does uh, GDA? Mm, no, but it, there is a game fest. Okay, so it's I'll call it game fest. Yeah, but yeah, game definitely game. going to like something um, at Scad because the difference between like I think the game development programs here and at Scad is Scad is more, way more art focused. Are focused, so um, they're they're going to be a lot more modelers. There are going to be a lot more people who like do concept art and stuff like that. You can find definitely find like people there. Yeah, there is a game get uh, a scad game fest. I'll finish that. I'm gonna come to you. Uh, I would also recommend Georgia State since they recently had the CMI being set up and they have uh, a lot of new people in for like VR AR content creation too. So I would also look there. And before that. This doesn't mean that you guys have to all go to school. Wait, him and then him. Sorry about that. Yes, we. It doesn't like I said. It doesn't always mean that you have to go to school to get these things. There is a CFA South, but there's also things like Terminus Film Festival. So extending your range beyond just uh, gaming is a really good way to find artists. Uh, like for example, like uh, it's not just a CFA, but then there's also like meetups uh, at Hodgepodge for like comics artists as well too. And uh, the one of the best things that you can do is also online. Uh, online, online space nowadays. Uh, I think. Uh, what is one of the websites that you use? So, um, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. So uh, the independent group I was working with, that I mentioned before, I found them through IndieDB. There's also ModDB, but ModDB is more for people who want to like modify existing games. And then uh, there's a group called Dark Creations who are who are doing uh, like a full-on modification of Skyrim. And so it was called like Skyrim Beyond or something like that. Yeah. But yeah, if you sure. find out where all the art students go, you'll, you'll find it. Uh, but I think uh, the other part of it would also be to prepare your brief. Because once you meet them, you have to sweep them. <laughs> That's what I call them. It's like, hey, would you like to work on my game? What's your game about? Um, let me prepare something. And they're looking at them like, oh no, is this another exposure waste my time thing? So if you have something that's a little bit more fully fledged, which still allows them to put their creative input into it, that's something that can also like make a little bit more of a partnership type of thing. Hello. Hi. Yeah, all right. So uh, given a small scenario, let's say I need a 
Oh, I'm so sorry. I usually just jump into these. I don't want to. Hi, I'm Brandon. I'm a senior at KSU game developer, if you, if you know me. Hi, everyone. Um, In case you're an artist and he's looking for one. You know. <laughs> I got you. Um, so given a small scenario, I'm looking for a kitchen set. I need toasters and cutting boards and forks and knives modeled and textured. How much, yes, no, I'm not looking to go to, uh, okay. How much should I pay an artist? How do I know how much to pay you? Alisa, let's start you off with pricing first. Because mm -hmm. Alisa has her own panel on pricing things. Yes. Ah. <laughs> yes, yes. Plugs. How to figure out how much to, to pay an artist. There are so many ways that you can do this. You can go the route of just asking artists how much it would cost and then getting a list. I would uh, recommend just making your own classified listing and saying exactly what you need, what are some references, and then sending it out to artists who may want to do work for you and then seeing how much they um, charge for that. Uh, you can also figure it out yourself by um, f seeing the hourly rate for the average artist, figuring out how much time it takes based on how much time other artists have put in. Like on uh, ArtStation, a lot of artists will tell you how long things take in their descriptions and then figuring out like how much that's gonna cost per model. Or you could also go the route of just buying the pre-made models. Yeah, so sure. finding those models, seeing how much they cost, and then seeing how much uh, that artist who uh, made those models would charge for some commissions, maybe so you can get some custom ones. Gotcha, so you're suggesting take a look at how much the hourly wage would be and then pay that for the commission? You could do that for the commission, or you could see like the actual person who made the models that you're looking at, uh -huh. uh, like the template models, um, seeing how much they charge for the model, and then how much for the commission, and then see if there's like some sort of wiggle room to modify that model. Gotcha. Base rate in Atlanta, $25 per hour, up. <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> Ginger, I, I do have a comment on that too. I, uh, just, a, just as a question, uh, for the 3D assets you're looking for, are they custom, or are you looking for, you know, just a something to you know, put as a placeholder in, in the type of game you're, you're producing. Okay, yeah, because I was gonna uh, say you could look at like CG Trader and stuff like that, because they have like, yeah, yeah. But if you need custom, that's okay. Hi, JP Ray, I, um, I'm the uh, new professor at East Central University in Ada, Oklahoma. And we are developing a game development track for our visual art and mass communication media arts department. Um, my question was actually for Jeffrey. I was curious about the transition between 2D and 3D into VR because that's something our students are clearly interested in and that we're trying to develop as well. And we're not there yet, we're not ready. Um, so just that experience from your side and, and kind of recommendations or things that we should definitely consider. So just to break that question down a little sure. bit first, uh, so you're starting a course in game development in your university, mm -hmm. and you're trying to look for the information of how to help students transition into that, is that correct? Or? Right, From most of them are graphic designers, 2D artists, uh, digital um, artists, so like they do a lot of like reproduction. From normal things. art to game art. Right, well, and, and specifically, I was curious, of, since you've done it, was uh, was VR, like how you transition from just modeling and, and general game design development, which is something I do understand, into VR, which is something that's a little less familiar to me? Well, uh, first off, thank you for your question. And uh, so during the transition period from like 2D to 3D, it, it, it was a big jump because Unreal Engine is such a big, it's like, it, like Unity, it's a monster because uh, when you're doing 3D, it's not just you create the game art. Someone has to do the functionality of you know interactions with all the asset that's within the game. So you're gonna need programmers, someone who can do blueprinting. Uh, some technical artists, uh, like at Pulseworks, you have to do a little bit of blueprinting yourself. So for me, I had to do a little bit too, but I also work with the programmer to make sure that you know, what I'm putting in isn't going to break the game. So you do have to go through documentations. For me, I had to go through hours and hours of reading documentation. Even at work, I still have you know, uh, YouTube videos up as I'm you know, seeing how people set things up. Um, Unreal also has a marketplace where you can you know, purchase pre-made assets that you could you know, kind of tinker around with. But um, for the, but from the tr for my tradition transition from 2D to 3D, um, one of it is just make that logical con uh, uh, connection between like okay, you know, as a painter, I really understand lighting, uh, anatomy, you know, all the stuff for painting, composition, all that. So when you're in VR, now you're in a first person view now. And so when you're composing a scene or creating, you know, like uh, like a story, uh, like a trail for people to follow, like for us we do uh, like a ride. So you follow a preset path. 
And so as you go through this path, you know, what do you see in the way? You know, how would you frame it so that um, you're able to like create this illusion of like depth, but still draw people's eyes as you move through? And then, you know, would you put in fog effects or some sort of you know light shaft, some sort of you know, coloring effect to like make people like cat, you know, to catch your eyes? And then maybe have you know the story moments where maybe something shatters or something flying past you, you know, like Wishman. Yeah, so it's uh, there's there's a good amount of uh, things to consider, but if you're able to like make that connection between like 2D and composition cinematography with uh, the 3D aspect um, and plus interactivity, then that you'll probably have something there. Yeah. Oh yeah, hello. And also the other thing is, um, you might want to get people trying um, Quill VR or Anim VR because those are like you know, you just like go in, you draw stuff as well, but then it's learning to kind of operate in a 3D space. And I think that's that's the main thing for artists is for us, when we see something on screen, it's something that's kind of still. And especially for illustrators, we might not understand how or why it needs to move. So when we're going into the game uh, interactive realm, we need to actually understand that people are gonna be interacting with these things and it might be seen from more than one angle as well. Uh, so my question is actually for Elisa. Before I ask it, um, for Archer, are you one of the animators or do you mainly do project management? No, I worked on seasons three through seven of Archer as a character animator. Okay. Um, so my question is, because um, I saw Chris's talk yesterday about the, the ZBrush thing and he talked a lot about how they use 3D modeling and then give this to the 2D animators. Um, and I just wanted to ask, like, what what is it like um, working like that because I've never really seen this before where people use 3D models to create 2D animation, especially with the style that Archer is in, that the real um, extremely defined kind of 2D animation style. What I always like to bring up is how do you have 2D characters in a 3D car spinning and interacting with each other? Like how does that happen? And it's really good um, compositing. Uh, it's all done in After Effects, so after the 3D people have made their models, they've made the cars, they made the buildings, all that stuff, those assets get brought into After Effects, which is really great with 3D. Um, and also the 2D animators were animating with those models in After Effects. Also, the other thing to mention is that like with technology going further and further, there's going to be a lot of things that like, oh, they're using 3D, but you can't really tell it's 3D as well too. But I think uh, one of the important things about that is that like uh, uh, a lot of the uh, 3D and even in Archer and uh, what we're talking about right now as well too, is uh, it's about the functionality of the art. Still, we're like, we're still going back to how do you make sure that you're making something that fits in with the world of whatever everybody is working with. Hello. Hello, I am Daniel Otaibi. I am a second year computational media major, which is basically just computer science mixed with um, game design. Um, I'm very new to art and um, bad, I guess, yeah. And so um, one of the key advice that I hear a lot of the time is like, just start drawing anything. But a lot of the time when like the stuff that I wanna draw it ends up, or like maybe even like model or animate or something like that, it, it ends up being too difficult and then it leaves me like not wanting to continue. So what's a good way to find something that will both push me and like get me better, but also that I can actually finish? Do you have a mentor or anyone that can help you? <laughs> I'll tell you, I got that same advice um, from my first university. I went to a college before going to Savannah College of Art and Design. I won't name them because I'm not saying something positive right now. Um, but my professor kept telling me, just keep drawing, you'll get better and better, and I didn't. And um, I thought, if I keep drawing incorrectly, I will have a lot of bad drawings. Um, but what really did help was having a mentor be able to stand behind me and say, this is what you're not seeing move your hand more like that, this is what needs to be corrected, and then I could pay attention to those flaws and see things differently, and I could learn to train my hands to be more coordinated with my mind. Another plug for Asifa, we have a Facebook group that we do critiques on, so please join our Facebook group. Um, yeah. And the other thing about that too is um, uh, think about tools, because if you say for me, I'm not good with space and anatomy when I'm doing 2D, so I add in 3D. Uh, if I know that I'm not good at something, uh, like for example, I, I suck at math, so I will have like an online calculator that I can plug in to make sure that like uh, a lot of things that I have is there or find somebody who uh, you know you can trade skills with in that sense to kind of like, okay, 
how do I make sure that uh, like I'm not good at this, they're good at that. Can we merge our skill sets as well to kind of um, foster that? Yeah, I think working in a project setting also helps out with that. So if you have like a project with a team of people that you want to work on and someone you know on your team is really good at what you want to do, I would pay attention to them and have them kind of guide you through the process. And at the end of the day, you're still making something. At the, like you have a finished project. Um, and then you learn all the skills from the project. You can take that to another project if you want. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of curious. What type of art are you, are you doing? Is it like environment, characters, vehicle, animation? It's, it's definitely uh, a, a weird transition uh, going to tablet because of a lot of hand-eye coordination. Uh, yes, yeah, a lot of this practice, but in terms of like, you know, just drawing itself, uh, for the navy part, I mean, look for some sort of a life drawing. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, events all around. There's what, Joe Peary, I think, has one? Yeah. Uh, so there is a live drawing session with uh, Joe Peary. Uh, um, you can get that information from pros later if you want to know. It's usually $5, and they bring in a new model, model every day, uh, every Thursday evening. So that's another thing to, is to do is observational skills. When you're just drawing, um, make sure you're not just drawing something over and over. Really, really critically try to think about like why you're drawing certain things or like uh, what additional things can you bring to it. Like if you always draw the character face front, maybe try a different pro pose, you know, maybe from a different angle, a different perspective. Did we have any other questions yet right now? Oh, yes. Teresa, Teresa's on a run today. the range on this thing, there it is, okay. So um, I'm Davis, um, like several others here, I go to Kennesaw State and I'm a senior, so um, similar to the, Teresa, I believe you said, with uh, Kennesaw kind of trains you up, you, you become a jack of all trades and I'm, I'm thinking of going into VFX, tech art, I think that's kind of my niche that I wanna fill. So uh, at the beginning of this you had mentioned talking about um, when you know you're ready, so I haven't gotten to specialize with that, so I don't, think I'm going to be able to get into a job straight out of the gate out of college, so I'm probably going to be working somewhere while working that on that, so I want to know when I can actually try to get a job into the field with that um, skill. So how do you know when you're ready to right. get to the industry? Exactly. I just try. I just, I keep trying. I mean, I knew my skills weren't top of the line when I was in school, so I knew I needed to get that secondary um, skill lined up. Um, just because you're not ready right now doesn't mean you can't be in the industry. It's still up to you to decide what kind of connections you're going to be making and how you're going to make those connections. For me, it was joining organizations and getting behind the scenes so that I could talk to people that had no real business talking to me outside of the organization. And also uh, pairing myself up with people who were a lot stronger than me artistically. So staying around people who were very highly skilled so that I would be in their network and I could learn things from them. Yeah, I, w I would say pretty much the same. Like what, after, when I came out of college, um, even though I knew I wanted to get into like the dev side of things, I still rapid fired pretty much every job that, I, that was there. I still had some sort of skill set for it. So like I took a lot of animator jobs, a lot of 2D animator jobs. I did a lot of tests. Um, fired at pretty much con uh, companies all over the US. See what, see what bit, and eventually something stuck with development. I just lucked out. So. Mm -hmm. But that, that's what you gotta do eventually, so. Yeah, and uh, a lot of times when you get into a job, even as a junior artist, they you know, give you a time period to train up and, and learn how to use their software, because some companies have their own proprietary things. You're, you know, you're not gonna be using just Unreal Engine or Maya and stuff, you have to like, port it to other, other, other uh, things too. So um, as long as you have the ability to like, learn on the fly and, and you know, learn quickly, then you know, you're not gonna be short of a job. I like your realistic mindset in terms of like, I might not go out there and get a job at the top company I want, so I will work towards it. But I think it's always good to, you know, like, just do it anyways, because maybe somebody will come and say, hey, you know what, like, like we need someone like you, even though you don't have the skill set, you might have someone, something else. So just like put, put the stuff up out there, see what people keep continuously wanting. Uh, aim high, do your best, don't expect a lot, but just like keep doing your best. I think that's a good thing. Hello. Hi, uh, another another question. Uh, kind of following up, kind of like wrapping some of these things up for myself. Is is there a online resource anywhere where I can just kind of figure out what like industry standards are 
I know a lot of uh, studios use different standards, but there's got to be something that's kind of like a pretty strong current throughout everything. Is there anywhere that I can kind of learn what that is and kind of aim towards getting to that or like understanding what it is? So uh, the question again is, uh, what is uh, like what is the industry standard? How do I find out something about that? Yeah, like just to make sure that I'm moving to in the right direction. And you're a 3D modeler? 3D modeling, um, you know, rigging. I, I do, like I said, a little bit of everything. A generalist 3D at, at everything, so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's kind of hard to say that there's like a, a place, because every studio does things differently. So they may use the same tools, but they'll integrate it in different ways. Um, it depends on what the project is, what kind of game they're making, what kind of, you know, what kind of art they need. If it's 2D, if it's 3D, um, the, the development process is completely different. And even among 2D art, 2D like 2D art and 2D games, like there's different ways of implementing it. So um, it's good to learn like the the basic ones. But once you do get a job, you end up have you'll end up learning the development process that is standard for that studio. What what kind of bad habit? Do not knock open software. I thought you meant like industry standard as like your artistic level. No, 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 like oh, like the pipeline? I wouldn't be too afraid. They're going to teach you their pipeline. I mean, I learned a certain pipeline in school, and then when I got into different studios, each studio had their own pipeline, their own way of doing things. Um, and they were really open to teaching me. I, I'm super old school. I use X sheets when I animate. And, but I knew that when I went into like, an, um, like a television setting where people are using After Effects, they're not going to be too keen on that. Um, so it's really important that you just know how to do your thing. Like it's good to know how to model, how to animate, how to make games. And then they'll teach you how they want you to do it with their, their stuff. Yeah, uh, so even at Pulseworks, uh, when I got in, I knew Maya. But then uh, the guy next to me, uh, Nate, he knows 3ds Max and you know, some Maya. Then another guy, uh, Sam, he knows Maya and he picked up Modo. And then Orion now is picking up Modo. And then now for me, I'm also learning ZBrush on the side too. So it's kind of like as, while, while you're in there, they, uh, you know, you have a skill set ready for 3D modeling, so you know, stick to that. But on the side, you, know, you can kind of pick up other stuff along the way. Because the thing is, as long as you know how you know, the polish is supposed to work and, and all that, then you can you know, kind of work your way through all the other software too. Sorry about my passionate speech. <laughs> it's uh, mainly it's just because uh, one of the things is that sometimes uh, certain people will also like maybe they'll say, oh, maybe studios require certain softwares, but softwares die all the time and they be re they are reborn all the time. Like Toon Boom before it became a, uh, an animation industry standard was it, it took a long time before that happened. So these things are going to swap around all the time. So I think the main thing is to understand being flexible, being understanding the core skill of like okay. What is the purpose of having something that is 3D modeled? Because nowadays people can also use pho photogrammetry or like even volumetrics as well too. So these techniques are gonna evolve. But the one thing that doesn't evolve is they're using this as an asset. Like that, that's, that's the kind of thing that uh, um, maybe you should kind of like uh, take a look at in terms of like you can use Blender, that's great. You can sell yourself by saying that, oh, I am able to save you money because I know Blender which doesn't cost you money. So t try to take that as a spin as well too. And also, um, I have a story of when I was staffing a project for Blender. We needed a lighter who needed to have at least 10 years of experience. Um, yeah, try finding that. I found like five people in the US. I went to Blender, the software program, and asked, do you have anyone? And I ended up getting someone from France who was really good. But they paid him well only because he was um, so hard to find. So there is a little bit of value in you know, having your own niche. And I think you mentioned something about VR before too. Uh, the, the the niche. 
Uh, you mean like how VR still has a lot of like? Yeah, I think somebody asked uh, was was looking for. Oh, we want somebody in VR with uh, tons of experience. While like some parts of the field is relatively new, but we want someone who works at Unreal for twenty five years or something like that. Yeah, it's like uh, I've seen job openings that's like, oh, was it AI learning or something that came out two years ago? But you need ten years experience with that. And I'm like, hmm. Not unless I, you know, can like forward in the future or something. Any other Neural questions? Stuff. <laughs> Neural network stuff. While the technology hasn't been around for that long. <laughs> yeah, like Minority Report or something. <laughs> so also, uh, definitely look at where these things are being posted. If it's posted by people who know what they're doing, okay, maybe the, they know what they want. But if it's also by uh, recruiters that uh, send you information that we need these things, but they also don't know what they want, um, it can also kind of get confusing and you need to use your best judgment there. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah, um, I had one about, because obviously when it comes to art, you've got all these different styles. Um, and kind of different creative directions that you can take. And this often requires just different software, different, because obviously working in 2D animation and like the kind of manga and anime stuff that Jeffrey was talking about before is gonna be very different to the type of stuff you'd be doing on Archer and to like the, the full on 3D, um, 3D kind of animation that you see in video games these days. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about like the difference in workflow, like going from something like frame by frame 2D animation to then modeling and that sort of thing. Yeah, I think um, for the most part, it's like, it's just like any other art. It's a lot of problem solving, like getting, uh, like a lot of the times I'll get onto projects and we can do it in our own pipeline, but maybe they're asking for something um, special, like they want, like a specific style that we we're not used to doing, and so now we have to figure out what what the pipeline is going to be like. Um, we have, to, and a lot of the pre-production is going to be um, figuring out what we're going to do first, rather than like knowing ex knowing exactly what software we need to use. Like we'll have our we'll have our good we'll have our skill sets and everything, but it's not necessarily going to translate into like the project we want to have at the end of the day, if you, if you know what I mean. So it's it's a lot of figuring out like. What what, you, what we're gonna do, um, and oftentimes we just don't know, so. Yeah, that's a good question because it can get kind of esoteric, right? It's like what type of style is right for what type of story you're trying to tell or product you're trying to create. Because uh, one issue I've seen with 3D art is just it can get very stiff versus 2D, which is more gestural and very dynamic, right? But then now you're starting to see some 3D art that can mimic almost 2D, you know, with the cell shading and all that, and now you get 3D art that can almost mimic 2D dyna dan uh, dynamism. So yeah, it's 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 part of this game to know the type of software you're using, you know, limitation of what it can do. Is that like an amber alert or something? That's everyone's getting it. Oh, oh boy. Uh, but yeah, um, uh, yeah, knowing the software capabilities you have, your team as well, you know, what everyone's able to do. Uh, if you have a small team, then you might want to you know scale down what you're going to do. Usually, two D might be easier to do than three D. It's not as intensive. D again, it, it varies. Uh, this is just like a like a more generalized uh, way of saying it. Um, and then other than that. Uh, if there's ways to like make a story easier, like less interactivity, like if we're talking about games, for example, interactivity, uh, there's there are now like almost like cinematic-ish game with minor uh, interactivity, um, and then you have ones that are more involved, which require much more programming. So, yeah, it's a lot of stuff to juggle around. I, I, I wish I could answer the question fully. <laughs> I find that my working style changes. Um when it comes to the flexibility, like if I go from 2D to 3D, in 3D I do a lot of posing. I'll do all my key poses first. And then when I go into 2D, uh, I can just do a mix of doing my poses first and uh, doing some straight ahead, where I never do straight ahead when I'm working in 3D. And when I'm working with a lot more puppeted stuff, uh, I go back to my posing almost like it's 3D. Um, but I don't move the camera around. I just work with whatever drawings I have. So I work very strictly with the animatic. Um, so my mindset is always changing. Like it's been said earlier, is your planning has to change as well. Um, so if you are going to mix media, uh, then it's really important that you know what mediums that you're going to use, what software you're going to use earlier, um, so that you can plan out what's the best approach to getting it animated. The other thing is if you're doing like 2D frame by frame and you decide that you want to add puppets to your tool, start with something that's really small. Like work with something you're familiar with and then add, like maybe I'll add one moment where the character has a puppet rig like with their hand so that you don't feel overwhelmed. 
if you're if you're trying to tackle a new media, uh, remember that some people have been t trying to tackle that for maybe two, three years or longer than you are ready. So it might seem discouraging. So start with something you're familiar with. Slowly add things on as experimentation is a good way to kind of learn more about the different parts of the art as well. Uh, also, I would say um, go do some research outside to see um, if there's anyone who's done what you want to do, maybe uh, at, at a similar level. You can even ask them too. Uh, so like when I do VR, maybe I'm trying to do like snow trails for a tank or something, right? And I'll like find a package, but it's a starting point and then I'll contact the artist and like, oh, you know, I'm not get, it's not showing up, you know, the, the trails behind the tank or something. And then they'll say, oh, did you do this? Or they'll say, oh, here, look at these other resources. So that could help too. Starting with templates definitely helps sometimes. So my question is to piggyback on hers, like how do you find your own style? Your own style guy. How did you find your own style? Do you have a style? Uh, uh, so I will tell you the truth. I don't have my own style, own style. Um, I found a lot of people who've inspired me and who had work that spoke to me. And I have uh, slowly absorbed bits and pieces of their traits and their characteristics that are in their art. And um, I've turned that into a style that better expresses what I want to say. Have you ever looked at something and thought like, oh, that's, that's how I want to say that thing? That's how I want to express that thing. Uh, that's what I've done with my style. And I, I think it's easy to say that, oh, you just start drawing and whatever naturally comes out, comes out. Um, but that hasn't been the, the case just for me personally. Yeah, it's good to uh, be able to work in multiple styles as well. For me, I started off as, you know, uh, as I mentioned, manga, comic art. But now mine is more like almost matte painting, realistic concept art style. Uh, I do a lot of uh, like photo bashing, 3D render work, uh, and with like anime inclusion and all that. Um, but that's because I had a background in, 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 in like actual traditional art because uh, while I was in high school and until now, uh, I worked in like watercolor, gouache painting, oil painting, all that, so the skills transfer through. Um, but along the way, I've also done stuff like Safari, which is like a very cartoony uh, 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 animated TV show. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's the one with like the elephant with the like, zebra stripes and stuff and like other creatures. It's uh, uh, made in Unreal Engine too. So. Yeah, it's a live real-time animation in Unreal. Um, but the style of the uh, artwork they had me do was more cartoony. But then uh, from there, I went on to do, you know, like more concept parties type of style. But it's just something that, that, that uh, for me, I was interested in doing. And if you just a style that you're interested in, you know, there's no, there's no reason why you can't pursue that. But just know that the more styles you're able to do, the more jobs you're able to pick up. And then you're not just like, a, I guess they call it like a one show pony or something. Yeah. Yeah, one yeah. trick pony, yeah. For styles, it seems like um, you're going to be working in other people's styles unless you have a style that specifically that's yours that other people want. And that's the only real way you're going to like have your, make money off of your own style. Um, but for the most part, you're just going to be doing things um, for clients doing. And that's very, uh, that's a very interesting thing to bring up because like when we're talking about studio, like for example at Archer, everybody's drawing the same thing because you know, you don't want to have like Archer looking like a Bob's Burger and then he suddenly looks like a different thing on a different scene. But then if you go to the artist's private Instagram or their own private portfolio page, you will see that a lot of these artists actually have their own style. And some of them are just like far out, very different from like what you see them working on the show as well too. So it's okay to have your own art style. It's just that like uh, if you're going to work in the industry on an entry starting level and, and you're aiming for something that's not a startup company, you might not have as much creative input. If you're star um, starting out like a, a st small startup company where you do have the creative input, that's when you would be able to actually explore and see what works for you. And sometimes for different people, the things that work might be something that they're personally attached to or sometimes it works because that's the pipeline that they are able to get to work uh, over and over as well too. So right now we have around, um, Seven minutes left, so we have uh, time for probably a couple more questions if anybody wants to take the last couple questions. Yes, watermelon. So uh, I have two questions. Well, maybe, uh, <laughs> hi, I'm Who Chris. I'm the guy with the watermelon shirt. Um, two questions, well, maybe like one question, one observation. Your, your shirt's very nice as well. But um, so I believe portfolio review is excellent as well as peer review. However, since uh, you're often telling your uh, application and portfolio to the company you are applying to, um, even mid or small range companies, um, if you get a response, often is we can't really reply to this email because um, we are very busy, but thank you for your application. What is the best way, because there's probably no great way to get 
feedback from the people you are applying to? That's a great question. How do you increase your response rate? So I would say quality. If you send quality emails, you're more likely to get a quality response. And if you do more than send an email, um, you can send a letter, a physical letter, or you can also meet people. I, I say or, and, and meet people, and definitely meet people. Um, meet people who work at the studio, be able to name drop, so at least talk to people, even if it's virtually. I love using LinkedIn. People are more likely to respond to you on LinkedIn than they are on other social platforms because it is a business um, social media um, kind of platform. And so when you don't respond to your social media, uh, it's not a huge deal, but when you don't respond to your business media, then it's more of a, a faux pas. Yeah, I would say pretty much the same thing. Um, networking, like sending in your stuff is here and then networking is like way, way, way up here. So like if you have an in, like if you have, if you talk to someone there, I would email them di directly so that you get like a human response back um, rather than just, you know, the standard, like you can't respond to your email right now. Um, and then it's more likely to get in front of the eyes of like an, uh, a lead artist at the, at the studio um, in that case. Yeah, I've also had cases where I've been ghosted before too. You know, it's just I send it in, get no response back, just oh, can't use it. I know some just nothing at all. And sometimes it's probably because their HR has some sort of wall up where they search keywords or something. So if your resume doesn't have those key specific keywords in there, you might not even be looked at. So, um, so we did a talk earlier on um, branding for employment. I was there. Yes, <laughs> and we talked a little bit about um, applicant tracking systems and. Uh, optimizing your documents uh, so that when it's scanned, all those keywords hit. I definitely would add that into your emails as well. Um, and making sure that you don't say anything that's going to trigger spam. And there's a, a list of triggers for that you can find online. Uh, another thing I would do, uh, aside from meeting people, is also name dropping. If you can name drop in there, that's great. And name drop in the beginning. So instead of dear hiring manager or dear to whom it may concern, um, putting the actual name of the person. Be, be careful while name dropping. Make sure you actually know the person as yeah. well, too. Well, not just randomly grabbing people's names from the internet and be like, hey, it's this person. <laughs> he would never do that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was like, it's just a thing because like one of my friends actually got in trouble because somebody name dropped him. And then like uh, he's like, oh, shoot, I didn't even know this person type of thing. Like, like I've, I've seen they've asked me questions. So like he almost lost his job for the name drop as well. So that's, that's the main thing is make sure the re uh, relation you're cultivating is actually genuine. And um, if you're gonna name drop someone, ask them. Maybe like, hey, is it okay if I, you know, like ask these things about this stuff? And you can always send update emails. Like when you have new work, you know, try to send updates um, on, on, on what you're working on. The other part is like when you're first sending your first email, try to just be really formal. Because uh, if, even if you're trying to joke, sometimes you don't know who is getting that email and that could come rub, rub them the wrong way. They're not your friends yet. They could be in the future, but not just yet. So that kind of professionality is also very important as well, too. Um, it's better because they'll be like, hey, they have at least... You have a mic. They have, <laughs> oh, sorry. They've kind of um, done the research and shown interest about our company rather than it being a cold email. So it, it's, it's a, a better cold email. Yeah, don't be discouraged, though, because HR leave all the time. Yeah. So, you know, you, you get it in, oh, nobody's responding to me. Maybe, maybe a new HR comes in, they're eager to recruit, and they're like, you said it again, and again, and again, unless you're blacklisted. <laughs> Yeah, so I think um, that's all the time we have for today. But uh, thank you guys very much. Those are really, really awesome questions. So if you guys want to mingle with the people. And you can find me at alisalewis.com. Yes. Social media, is anybody? Uh, you can find me at Jeff, J-E-F-F-Y-U, is my last name, and art.com. Yep. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. Um, it's sacred, so S-A-Y-K-R-D. Or you can find me on Instagram at the same tag. So usually we have to try to clear the room. So uh, if you have any questions, you want to interact, you know, leave your business card, name cards, let's go do that outside. So thank you guys very much for coming. It's been awesome.